go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Bard Graduate Center and Mabuhay to my Filipinos. My name is Angela, and I'm currently a second year master's student here at the Bard Graduate Center. If this is your first time with us here, the Bard Graduate Center is a graduate research institution devoted to the study of the material world, seeking knowledge about the past and striving for critical understanding of our present and presence here. As such, we respectfully acknowledge this place as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenni Lenape, and recognize New York City as past, current, and future home for many indigenous people. Tonight, we're here in our classroom building and library, also home to our study collection. And just a few doors down the street, we also have our gallery, um, which currently has a wonderful exhibition on the artist and designer, Sonia Delaunay, um, which I hope you will come back and explore. The subject of tonight's event, the Philippine Village at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, has long held interest for me. I spent part of my childhood in St. Louis, where I lived and went to elementary school not far from Forest Park, the site of the World's Fair. One year when I was in elementary school, we had an assignment to research and present to at the class on a topic related to the World's Fair. As a young Filipina American, I was excited to connect this assignment to my own heritage. In what I consider to be my first ever research project, I shared with my classmates the story of the Philippine Village, elementary school version. Meanwhile, other students in my class presented on the invention of the ice cream cone. <laughs> As an adult researcher, I have continued this interest here at BGC, uh, where some of my work and my thesis project focus on the reception of the Philippines in the United States via material objects. I was so excited when I got the opportunity to invite our guest tonight, who will share with us how she honors the legacy of the people who lived and died in the Philippine village through a series of creative research projects. Jana Anyonuevo Langholz is an interdisciplinary artist whose practice spans photography, installation, performance, publications, and social engagement. She was born at the site of the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri, and lives and works at the former site of the Philippine Village. Her site-specific work and research primarily investigate the period of United States colonization of the Philippines between 1898 and 1946, and how it has shaped the histories and geographies of the Midwest and South. She creates public participatory projects outside institutional frameworks to expose historical and present-day injustices and reclaim her own heritages. Her work has been featured in the Riverfront Times, St. Louis Public Radio, Esquire Philippines, and World Literature Today. She was named Best Activist in Riverfront Times Best of St. Louis 2021, and she has unrecognized ancestral contributions in museum collections across the United States and is the caretaker of the Philippine Historic Village Historical Site in St. Louis. So please join me in welcoming Jana. <laughs> All right, thank you so much to Angela for the introduction. And um, thank you so much to Bard for hosting me in New York City and the invitation to speak. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for coming out to hear me talk tonight. It's really good to see everyone here and a lot of friends in the audience. Um, so thank you. So in this talk, I'm mainly gonna focus on my work establishing the Philippine Village Historical Site and a few projects related to it. Just a quick content warning, I will be sharing a lot of historical images that some might find distressing. However, I'm going to share personal context behind them and talk about how they have been important in my work and even empowering to me. I'm also really grateful for this opportunity to look back at how far this work has come, and I'll be happy to do my best to answer any questions during the Q&A or privately afterwards. So you're probably wondering what National Geographic and Jaws have to do with each other. It has to do with how my parents spent. <laughs> my mom is from the Philippines, and my dad is a German-American from Iowa. In the 1980s, my dad had been working in Saudi Arabia as an architectural advisor to the US Air Force. But he once told me that he had also always aspired to become a National Geographic photographer.
He traveled to over 25 countries during that time and took hundreds of color slides. I'm gonna show just a few of his snapshots from the Philippines. Because he was an architect, many of his photos were of native houses. This is a traditional house in the province of Ifugao. I think you can see someone looking out. Um, this is a house in Ilo Ilo in the Visayas. A house in Bohol in the Visayas. Zamboanga in Mindanao. And this is my grandpa's Bahai Kubo, or cube-shaped house on our mountain farm. Bahai Kubo are traditional native houses in the Philippines and vary in design by region. That's my grandpa Alberto and my uncle Jessel walking towards the house. And I think this was 1989 when I went back to the Philippines as a one-year-old. My dad and my mom met while he was photographing in the Philippines. One of their first dates was to see the movie Jaws in theater. My mom told me that it affected her decision in moving to the United States. <laughs> when my dad asked her where she wanted to live after they were married, she pointed to the middle of the US map at St. Louis, not knowing anything else about it, except for that it's landlocked and that there are no sharks. <laughs> and this is my mom on their honeymoon in northern Luzon before moving to St. Louis. She went to stand at the highest point in the mountains in Atok, 7,400 feet above sea level, as far away from the ocean as possible. So in the 1980s, my parents moved to St. Louis and I was born in a hospital at the former site of the 1904 World's Fair. During my mom's naturalization ceremony, I was still teething and found an American flag to chew on. This photo of my dad and I was published in a local paper, and I think it's funny that the headline under the photo is Patriotic Day. I grew up and have lived in St. Louis most of my life, except going to college in rural Missouri and grad school in Dallas. I was always aware of the 1904 World's Fair. I can't pinpoint the exact time that I learned about the Philippine village, but I remember always knowing about it. I never had a Filipino teacher, and I never had an Asian teacher until I was in college. When I was struggling in my undergrad art program, the photography professor, who was from India, asked me to do an independent study with her. She asked me if I was mixed. Her work explored hybrid identity, and it was the first time I was asked questions about heritage in my own work. And this is one of the photographs I made when I was working with her in 2010. This is another silver gelatin print from a series called Cutting Out a Space where I made temporary paper installations and self-time self-portraits in an abandoned building. You can see me standing there in the back behind the paper garlands. I didn't make the connection at the time, but I now think of the abandoned building as a metaphor for the Philippine village, and not an attempt to rebuild, but to find ways of being within an environment that has been destroyed. And I'm only gonna share one project from grad school called Cyanotypes of My Grandmother. Um, almost all of my family's photos and albums in the Philippines had been destroyed over time by typhoons or termites. It felt like a revelation to find this negative of my grandma Laura in my mom's old things. When I found it, my grandmother was around the same age in the photograph as I was at the time. A lot of my relatives have always said that I look like her. I had never met her and knew that she died as a young woman. I made a sequence of 70 cyanotypes, beginning with a one second exposure, then two seconds, three seconds, and so on until I reached a five hour exposure so that the very first print was almost invisible 
and the last print was oversaturated. For anyone that isn't familiar with the process, a cyanotype is a medium that used to be more commonly used for architectural blueprints. For me, spending that time in the darkroom, gradually watching my grandmother appear in the frame was a way of finally getting to meet her. And I just want to briefly mention the scholar Sarita C's book, The Decolonized Eye Filipino American Art and Performance, which was really influential for me in grad school. I was most interested in the epilogue of the book, which, is, which described her experience coming to St. Louis for the 2004 centennial of the 1904 World's Fair. She and her tour group got lost looking for the site of the Philippine village. I started thinking about how to commemorate the site and how to make sure no one would get lost again. I began the project Filipino American Artist Directory after grad school, but I had never met another Filipino American artist before. It was inspired by C's analysis of Filipino American art and performance. My goal with the project was to connect 1,200 uh, Filipino and Filipino American artists in the United States and the Philippines to reclaim the site of the 1904 World's Fair, which had produced representations of Filipinos and indigenous peoples that have persisted since then, especially in St. Louis. During that time, I also produced three directory publications that listed the participating artists. It was a really successful but overly ambitious project during the six years I dedicated to it. And this is a map of the cities where the artists were located. I switched gears during the pandemic when it became less and less feasible to host that many artists in St. Louis at one time, especially as we were all social distancing or in lockdown. I was sitting in my apartment during lockdown and decided to order a custom sign that said Philippine Village Historical Site on it. I figured that I was here at the site indefinitely and that I didn't know when I was gonna be able to leave. So imagining that I was now the historical site headquarters was kind of amusing to me and also helped me get through the worst parts of the pandemic. In those moments of solitude, I found solidarity with the people who lived here before me in 1904 and weren't able to leave the reservation. I wanted to know what their everyday lives were like, how they died, and how they found meaning in their experiences in St. Louis. I took this picture of myself holding the sign outside of my apartment building on April 10th, 2021. I took it on my cell phone and used a self-timer on a tripod. I didn't take this photo with any other intentions except to post it on my Instagram. It became the first post on my personal account that went viral. A lot of people wanted to know where the sign was gonna go because they thought it was the official sign and was just waiting to be installed. And I chose the fleur-de-lis as the symbol on the top because it's also on the flag of St. Louis and that's likely why people thought it was legit. <laughs> So at this point, a lot of things start happening at once. I'm gonna do my best to keep them in order, but my different efforts will also weave through each other as I do my best to explain everything that's happened since then. I had also just learned about the death of Mora, a young Igorot woman whose death anniversary coincided with the founding of the historical site. There was an unusual spring snow on April 20th, 2021, and didn't stop snowing until the next day. I read a headline in the local newspaper that it hadn't snowed on that specific day in St. Louis since 1904. I knew that the Philippine village residents would have been in St. Louis at that time and thought it was an interesting coincidence. Right away, I started searching online for newspaper articles on the same dates. The first article I came across noted the reaction of Philippine village residents to their first snow. It read, St. Louis, April 21st. The heavy fall of snow here is not causing any suffering among the Filipinos at the expo exposition grounds reservation. As soon as the Filipinos saw the snow, they called it sugar and rushed into it despite the cold. They were soon sent back into their quarters to prevent them from contracting pneumonia.
Then I read that Mora died. She had come down with pneumonia on April 10th, a little over a week after arriving in St. Louis, and passed away at a local hospital 10 days later on April 21st, 1904, the day it snowed. On her deathbed, she made a final request that she would be buried in the land of her birth. But after her death, her body was kept on display at the funeral home alongside the bodies of two young Igorot men who had also died from pneumonia, Suyun and Mariano. The spectacle of their deaths became part of the attractions at the 1904 World's Fair. Visitors streamed into the funeral home to view their bodies over the eight month period that the fair ran. In December 1904, an article stated that the bodies were still there and becoming mummified, even though officials had made promises to ship them home months before. I tried to find the funeral home, but it had been closed for decades. I also tried to find the hospital where many of the Philippine village residents died, but it was destroyed by a tornado in the 1920s. I did, however, visit the empty lot where it once stood. And this is a photograph of the hospital where Mora died before it was destroyed. I hardly knew anything about Mora, but I made her a promise that I would never forget about her, that I would do everything in my power to honor her, that I would pay my respects to her at her grave and help her return home if she was still in St. Louis. After I made that commitment, I began searching for her grave every day. I also had a necklace made with her name on it that I wore every day so I wouldn't forget. I also began to record the names of other people that I learned about who lived and died in the Philippine village. I continued reading the newspaper from 1904 every day on the corresponding day in the present so I could follow the events of the fair day by day and understand their experiences a little bit at a time. It became two separate but related projects called 1,200 Lives and Deaths at the 1904 World's Fair and Today in 1904. I posted my day-to-day -day research in my Instagram stories because it's a medium that's usually used to share current events. I wanted to bring 1904 into the present so I could fully understand. One of the many people I learned about was Teresa Ramirez. A majority of the Philippine village residents were around 18 to 30 years old. This is a photo that was taken when she lived in the Visayan village. She was an outspoken teenager from Iloilo who also spent a good amount of time in St. Louis boycotting the Philippine village school. She hated being called a savage and would get annoyed with curious visitors' questions, including, do you wear shoes in the Philippines? Is there money there? Do you like chickens? She also noted that the American boys flirted too much. She preferred wearing Filipiniana over American dresses and wanted to become a stenographer when she returned to the Philippines. I began giving guided walks as part of my practice. My history with walking as practice goes back to when I joined an artist group on a backpacking trip in the Pacific Northwest to unwalk a portion of the Lewis and Clark Trail, meaning we walked it in reverse. If you think about the idea of unwalking history, you have to start at the end point and go all the way back to its source. I think that's an idea that's carried through in my work since then, and I'll pick that idea back up in a little bit. So I'm gonna share a few photos from my walks. This is a photo I took on a medium format camera of Jovel Tamayo, who is also a photographer, and her siblings and dog. And I included a few more photos of friends tonight because I believe some of them are here. Um, so shout out to Chris Bonnes, Lugau Kasberg, Say more with the banana trees. Um, and this is a video still. It was really windy that day, so the leaves were blowing around her. Um, this is a Filipino family that recently moved to St. Louis from New York and came to visit me. And Alexis. I don't know if they're here. I also thought about the historical marker in the way that everyone who came to hold the sign 
and carry it with me through the neighborhood became part of a collective monument. That the sign wasn't the monument, but the people who came to hold it. It also became a way for me to start to engage neighbors in conversations about the Philippine village. So this is a map of my neighborhood in 1904. It's sourced from the centerfold of the original Philippine village brochure. There was already a key included, but it wasn't totally accurate. So I added my own text and my sticker at the top. It was over 40 acres and had six different anthropological villages, a Philippine soldiers camp, a replica of Intramuros, and several other buildings constructed out of native materials. And this is the front and back of the brochure I was referring to, which contains the map. I'm just gonna show a few scenes from the Philippine village in the past and in the present. So this is the Bridge of Spain crossing Arrowhead Lake into a replica of Intramuros, which is a walled city in the capital of Manila. And this is the same spot today, which is now a private gated neighborhood called White On Terrace. This is a view of some of the houses in the Visayan village by the lake where Teresa Ramirez lived. And this is the same view in the present. The water in the lake is now gone, but the depression in the land where it once was is still there and is now a park. These are houses in the Igorot village. And this is the parking lot where it once stood. None of the structures from the Philippine village still exist. It's now a mostly residential neighborhood with a couple schools, some shops, and a Lutheran seminary. When I give guided walks, I try to describe where, we'd, where we would be standing in 1904. I later began working with the mayor and her task force to begin making preparations for a permanent historical marker. Since I knew it would be a long process, I decided I would continue to carry the temporary sign until the permanent one was placed. This is a photo of the mayor and I in October 2021 when she presented me with a proclamation acknowledging Filipino American History Month for the first time in the city of Clayton. Working with the city over the past three years has consisted of attending a monthly meeting with the mayor and her task force, writing a proposal, presenting it to local committees for approval, and writing the text for the plaque itself. I didn't previously have any experience with local government, but it didn't feel much different than being in grad school committee meetings. <laughs> While I was working with the city on the permanent historical marker, I also began planning memorials for the people from the Philippines I knew were still buried in St. Louis. While I was trying to find Mora's grave so that I could pay respects to her, I also found 16 others who had died. I was able to determine that at least 10 were still in St. Louis and buried in three different cemeteries. What I knew about Philippine funerary customs is that my family has a ceremony and feast yearly for our relatives who had passed. To think that these individuals buried in St. Louis didn't have a ceremony for over 118 years was unimaginable to me. I was also mindful that each of these people came from a different tribe or ethnic group, and that they each needed to have their own appropriate ceremonies. So instead of placing grave markers right away, I wanted to connect with descendants or representatives of each community Oops. To determine the best way to honor each of these people. The only person who ever received a headstone in 1904 was a young Filipino soldier named Joaquin Amayo. He was part of the Philippine Constabulary, which was the Philippine branch of the US Army at the time. And so he was buried at a military cemetery in St. Louis. He died around 21 years old from beriberi, which is a vitamin B1 deficiency. A 
Another cemetery where two young men were buried was a mass grave at the site of an abandoned hospital where smallpox victims were buried. The names of the two young men were Igud and Ramon, and they were Bogobos from Davao del Sur in Mindanao, which is the southernmost island in the Philippines. Since their gravesites are on private property and it's not officially designated as a cemetery, I had to get permission from the quarry who owns it. They told me that they get a lot of ghost hunters, but that I didn't look like one. So they didn't mind me visiting and wrote me a permission slip in case police thought I was trespassing. It might be a separate project in the future to get permission to place memorials for Igud and Ramon there as well. Lastly, in a large Catholic cemetery, I plan to place six grave markers for Ibai, Falayai, Basilio, Malakito, Dadao, and Luisa Francis Bihinang. They were all indigenous people. A young Mangyan man, two young Aita men, an Aita newborn, and two Filipino Muslims, a young Maranao woman, and a young, possibly Maguindanao, soldier. They were buried in the same lot side by side, except for Luisa, the newborn, who was buried slightly further away. This is the article that was published when Luisa Francis Bihinang was born. She was named after the city of St. Louis, the president of the 1904 World's Fair David Francis, and her mother Bihinang. Luisa died 10 days later on April 20th, 1904, the day right before Mora died. These are Luisa's parents, Bihinang and Sayas, who returned to Bataan in the Philippines after the fair. In the meantime, I went to the cemetery every week to bring fresh flowers while I tried to find their descendants. The cemetery initially cut rectangular spaces in the ground for the grave markers because we thought we would be able to install them much sooner. But then I came across new information that changed our plans. It was at that point I learned about something that I had only heard rumors about, but then learned was actually true. I don't remember what I was searching for, but I enjoy reading catalogs and reference books and stumbled across a document dated 1905 from the National Museum, which is now the Smithsonian. It listed recent accessions to their collections. There were five brains listed from individuals who lived in the Philippine village at the 1904 World's Fair. And this is a close-up of the entry. I could recognize right away that one belonged to Mora because her hometown was mentioned and no one else that I knew of from Suyok had died. I was also able to confirm that the entry, Brain of a Male Bontok Igorot, belonged to a young man named Suyon. A researcher named Patricia Affable had compiled information about Igorots who had participated in fairs in the early 1900s and had published an article in Igorot Quarterly in the year 2000. Another entry was listed as Brain of a Tagalog. It might have belonged to one of the teachers, Antonio Estudillo. He was the only person I knew that died in 1904 who was specifically identified as a Tagalog. This is a portrait of Antonio that was taken before his death and that I recently colorized because I like how it brings out more details that I hadn't noticed before. I didn't find out until later that another one of the entries, Brain of Amoro, belonged to Dadao, the young Maranao woman whose body was buried in the cemetery where I was placing grave markers. I realized that I would also have to figure out how to make sure that Dadao's brain and body could be together again. She was estimated to be around 32 years old. I haven't confirmed a photo of her yet, but I believe she might be one of the young Maranao women seated in this photo.
So I'm going to transition for a moment away from the deaths, but come back around to this topic again in a moment. While I was doing this work at the historical site, the cemetery, and the Smithsonian, I also came across names of my own ancestors in the catalog of exhibitors. They didn't come to St. Louis, but our trees did, as well as medicinal plants and other native items from our town for the exhibit displays. There were over 70,000 displays of Philippine exports in 1904, in addition to the anthropological villages. The Philippine village brochure boasted 50 million acres of timberland in the Philippines, now available to American investors, citing it as the country's greatest source of wealth. This image is from uh, one of my pieces called Zoom Call with Ancestors, using painted portraits of my relatives that date back to the 1600s. These portraits have presided over my family's altar in the Philippines for generations, but no one knows their names or anything else about them. I made this piece with AI technology, and in the video, they turn their heads side to side as I move mine. I consulted with my mom about the names I had seen in the catalog, and she said that those relatives used to live right across the street from our big family house. When we went to the Philippines last year, I went to interview my relatives and brought materials from my research to show them. But it was so long ago that not even they remembered the names of those ancestors. My uncles rode their bikes around town asking for more information about those people, but nothing came up. I spent an afternoon in the town cemetery looking for inscriptions of their names on graves gravestones, but I couldn't find them either. This is the public cemetery in my town, where the tombs look like houses and is a city in itself. I do know that my ancestors contributed a model house to the displays. I made this photograph using materials from University of Michigan collections with a model house that might have been shown at the 1904 World's Fair. The background of Nipa Palms was from a postcard that I had enlarged and reprinted because it's the same material that it would have been used to build the house. There is a ceramic chicken and a ceramic cat sitting on either side like guardians because those artifacts were excavated near my family's town and those are always the first animals to greet me when I come home. Right before I had left for the Philippines, I had begun discussions with representatives of the Smithsonian to find out what needed to be done to repatriate the braids to their rightful communities. At that point, we all thought Mora's brain was still in the Smithsonian. They had promised for many months to host me in Washington, D.C., so that I could visit their off-site research facility and pay my respects. After we found out that Mora's remains were missing, things changed. They said that her remains were likely unable to be preserved and that they had probably been incinerated. They showed very little sympathy, and shortly after that, they stopped communicating with me. When I received the news, I went to the Igorot village outside my house in St. Louis and cried. And I left this slide intentionally blank. When unwalking a history, like my group did with the Lewis and Clark Trail, it's important to start at the end and go all the way back to the source. When I was in the Philippines, I also visited some of the places that the Philippine village residents called home. I knew that they were also places my dad had been and that I grew up seeing in his photos. I visited the mountains of Bataan, where the Aitos were from. I went to Mindanao, near the region where Dada was from. I also went to Mora's hometown in Benguet to meet her relatives. And this is the taxi I took to get there. And as you can see on the side, the name of the taxi was super great. A very kind driver in Baguio named Kuya Randy agreed to drive me, my mom, and a cousin three and a half hours north into the mountains and back in one day. He was Kankanaoi, which is the same tribe as Mora, and he translated and asked for directions along the way. He really deserves a shout out 
because he w became invested in my mission and made sure we got there safely. I'd also like to briefly introduce Tagmina, who was also from Suyok, the same town as Mora. She was likely one of Mora's relatives and one of the most photographed people in the Philippine village. Hers was the first photograph I ever saw from 1904. When I went to Suyok, the person who welcomed me was her grandson. This is Tagmina's grandson, Mr. Lawana and I, in Mora's hometown. He didn't know we were coming because there was no internet access and I wasn't able to contact him beforehand. Another Suyok descendant in the United States had given me his name. When we were in the taxi, we relied on Kuya Randy to make sure we found him, and Kuya Randy did not want to give up until we did. <laughs> it was one of the most powerful moments in my life to be able to stand there next to him, even though we had never known each other before that moment. He pointed to where Tagmina had lived on the other side of the valley. I felt as at home here as I did in my own family's town. In Mora's hometown in Suyok, I paid respects to her. There was no sign that marked the name of the town, so I sat on the edge of the mountainside, feeling every single mile of distance between there and St. Louis and my body. I told Mora what I would have wanted to say in the presence of her remains at the Smithsonian if she had still been there. I had never been in such a beautiful place and felt embraced by the hills surrounding me. My cousin took this picture when I wasn't paying attention. But going to Suyok and back didn't feel like closure to me. Back in the United States, near my dad's hometown in Iowa, I also went to visit the grave of the man who promised Mora she would be buried in the land of her birth. His name was Truman K. Hunt, and he became notorious for his subsequent Igorot shows throughout the Midwest and the United States until he eventually went to jail. I had no respects to pay him, and his grave had never been marked. When I returned to St. Louis, I put my focus into completing the permanent historical marker. My proposal was approved in July 2023, and the text for the plaque was just recently finalized within the past month. It will now go into production, which will take several, several more months. This, an, this is an additional sign that I commissioned a sign painter, Ka Eric, in my family's town in the Philippines to paint. I told him I wanted it to be similar to the signs I saw vendors using at the market, which have colorful stylized text and sometimes images. Mora's relatives in Suyok and I also plan to place a twin historical marker for her in the Philippines because we don't know for sure where she was buried. The necklace I wore for her every day for two years broke on the day I told her relatives I wanted to help place a memorial in her hometown too. But the historical marker in St. Louis will also honor the other 1,200 people who lived here before me. They make me proud to call the Philippine village my home. They were Igrots, Aitas, Mangyans, Bagobos, Miranaos, Samals, Visayans, and Tagalogs. I know that they were brave to come here and to endure the eight months in St. Louis that they did. They gave me a voice I didn't know I had, and so I will always use it for them, as well as my own ancestors, and make sure they are never forgotten. The end. I'm sure we all have many amazing questions. Um, I have a few of my own that I'm gonna start off with, but then we'll definitely open it up to the room um, in just a few moments. Um, so thank you so much again for your talk, Jonna. Um, 
one of the things that you showed us tonight was how you take people on these walking tours of the Philippine Village Historical Site. And I think it's such an amazing way to connect with um, all these different groups of people and different communities who may or may not have um, connections to this event. And I was just wondering what you really hope that people who come on these tours with you will take away from the experience. Mm. Um, this is on. Okay, here we go. Um, I think that everyone who's come to visit me at the historical site has had different reasons for coming. And so um, I usually let them tell me what they want to see or what they want to learn about and how far they want to walk. Um, so it's a little bit like a choose your own adventure in that way. I have a big um, map on a piece of foam core because I'm very low tech. Um, and I carry that around and um, people who go on these walks with me can you know, point at a place on the map and um, I can take them to where it was since there's nothing left. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, a lot of us in this room are historians or maybe artists as well who might have also um, spent a lot of time working with archives. And I know that you've spent a lot of time working with archives and doing research for this project and are also creating um, kind of an archive of material related to the Philippine village. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the importance of this kind of archives and record keeping and what you hope, um, what it means for you to create this archive and um, what you hope might become of it. Oh gosh, yeah, I've been in so many archives in the past couple of years, I don't even know where to start. Um, yeah, in the process of doing this research, um, I've also uh, started looking outside of archives because I felt like I exhausted all the archives that there are. <laughs> um, and so um, through the historical site, I've also been building this collection of things that I find. Um, people have um, donated photographs to me um, that their uh, grandfather or great-grandfather took at the fair. Um, and I've been um, finding postcards at places like estate sales, auctions, um, and um, uh, just building this list on the Philippine Village Historical Site website of this, of this growing collection of things um, that I think are related. Um, I think the other part of your question was like, what is the importance of... Uh, um, I just, I think it's really important to preserve these materials, even though um, I know a lot of the content is um, very racist or distressing, but um, it's part of history. It's part of our history. And so it needs a place to live. And um, if it's gonna live anywhere, it, I thought it should be at the historical site. Thank you. Um, now, if anybody in the audience has any questions, you can raise your hand. I will do my best to call on you, and we've got a, a microphone coming around as well. Um, so if anybody has any questions, yes, there will be a microphone coming. Hi. Thank you for your wonderful research and uh, all the work you've done. Um, my name is Rosley, and I am a president of a nonprofit that started here um, New York based, Bacas Pilipinas. We are dedicated to the preservation of um, Philippine architectural heritage in, in the Philippines. So this interests me a lot because um, even though it is not exactly in the Philippines, the physical evidence is here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like an opposite. Um, how do people know the, the, the two? Like if they go to Ifugao, how will they know that you had you're giving these tours, for example? You know, how people in the Philippines would know that I'm doing this work? Yeah, or visitors in coming to the Philippines, who might, who might, how would they know about it? Um, well, I have a website and have been um, trying to connect with people. Um, just online. Um, social media has been really helpful for connecting uh, with people outside the United States and in the Philippines especially. Um, and um, yeah, I think a lot of uh, my work has been um, uh, through uh, like social media outreach has really helped a lot in that way. I think um, that, that 
working with. And then and by the same token, how can we know more <laughs> to go to this- to go to St. Louis and right, and yeah. I guess that's still a question <laughs> to figure out. Thank you. But thank you very much for the question. Yeah. Also, um, in the front row up here. Um, hi there, Jenna. Thanks so much for sharing this incredible, incredible work. Um, I had a question about um, interpreting some of the kind of the many different stories that are part of the World's Fair, um, and so obviously the um, you know the indigenous communities are um, kind of the focus of your work, but I'm curious how you um, interpret and think about some of these um, these these other other figures, people who are parts of the constabulary or people who are part of the like the the band. Um, how do you tell kind of multiple stories about about the fair through your through your work? Right, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, I think my work has mostly been focused on the indigenous peoples because um, it has been about uh, memorializing those grave sites. And so that's been the bulk of my research the past couple of years. But there were also 700 Filipino soldiers who were part of the Philippine Constabulary and Scouts um, and made up the majority of the residents of the Philippine village. So I know that was a big part of the fair. Um, I just haven't done very much research myself about it. And I know that other people have. Um, there's a descendant of one of the musicians who's, uh, who wrote a really great book about the Constabulary. And I can't remember the name right now. Um, but I know there has been other really good research done about um, the soldiers. And um, I know there were also 100 carpenters who built the Philippine village um, in 1903. Um, and they came from different regions in the Philippines to build the exhibit and then went home before the, the fair began. Um, so. Um, I saw a hand raise um, in the back, kind of just there. Sorry, I can't really identify. Hi there. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you what you wanted the response from the Smithsonian to be when you heard that um, the remains weren't recoverable, weren't cataloged, because obviously you had found the you had done the research and found the proof that they had been sent there at some point. What did you, what would you wish that that response would be if they had kept in contact with you? That's a really good question. Um, I guess I wish that they would have delivered it in a more empathetic way. Um, it was, I can't remember how long it was now, maybe two years ago, summer uh, 2022. Um, and I think we were just in a Zoom discussion about it. And um, it was just very straightforward, you know, no emotion. And then that was it. Um, and um, maybe I wish there was more discussion about it or that they would have talked to me more um, or, you know, they would have offered some kind of comfort or something, but um, this was also a repatriation department, so they're probably um, more used to dealing with these kinds of situations than I am. Um, um, but I just wish it was something more for everything that I had been through to just come to an end at that point. I think there was another hand up um, in that area in the back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my question is, um, oh, sorry, I, I think I have a comment as well. Um, uh, there's an artist called Taryn Simon. Uh, she's a photographer, I think based here in New York City, and, and she's made work about uh, some of the descendants of um, those people who you have discussed um, today. Um, so I, that's worth checking out. Um, and my... My question is um, about the nature of your research is also um, dealing with uh, emotional, uh, if not spiritual and psychological uh, phenomena and material. For example, you talk about ritual. Um, I wonder if you could just you know talk about it more because I think those in a Euro American um, culture only think of uh, Christianity and are not thinking 
uh, that there are other spiritual paradigms. I mm. think. Uh, that might be a hard question for me to answer. Um, I can speak for um, my own family and my relatives. Um, I guess as far as the spiritual dimensions of my work, um, I mentioned the altar um, and those uh, paintings of relatives uh, um, that are still uh, still on the wall around our altar. Um, we have a ritual called a padasal um, every year. Um, for my grandparents and other relatives. And um, what it is, is um, kind of a repetition of names, um, kind of like a chant. And um, then we, we go to the cemetery, we have a feast. Um, and I can't really speak too much in depth about those traditions because I'm still learning about them myself. Um, but I know for um, the other cultures, um, the, the other people that were buried in St. Louis, um, most of them weren't Christian. Um, there were two Muslims, and um, I believe the others were animists. Um, so, um, sorry. <laughs> um, Am I am I am I kind of coming close to what you're? Okay. Um. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, there's someone in a green. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Camille. I'm a big fan of the research and work that you've done. Um, I'm curious with your current role sort of as this caretaker of the present site, if you could share a little bit more about um, one, the limitations you're finding with the desires that you have ultimately for the space and how you would like the space to be taken care of. Um, you shared a little bit about your collaborations with the city, which I can only imagine are limiting in many ways. Um, but I'm curious just to hear from what you've learned and what you've experienced, um, what you ideally would like to see happen with the existing space. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Camille. Um, let me see, um, let me uh, rephrase your question again. Um, what I hope to see happen with the historical site, like going forward. Um, well, the next big thing is that the um, like the permanent historical marker is going to go in the ground in hopefully by the end of the year um, so that I won't have to carry it around anymore so I can kind of retire that part of the project and move on to other things, which will be, I think, a big weight off of my responsibility. Um, so um, once the permanent historical marker is installed, I think... Um, that will give um, people um, more independence to come to the historical site and not have to rely on me to come out with the sign. Um, but I will continue to do guided walks for people who request them, I think, going forward. Uh, let's see what else. Um, there's a lot of stuff I want to do, actually. Um, I do want to develop kind of like a self-guided walk um, is one thing I want to do. And... Um, one, an, okay, another thing is that I really one day want to have a, a building or a space at the site so that I can host people properly and have a library and just a gathering space um, outside of my apartment in the coffee shop. So it can actually be, you know, an actual uh, historical site, library, museum, et cetera. I have another question. Okay. Um, so I know a lot of your work revolves, uh, revolves around the lives of the people um, in the Philippine village, um, but you also mentioned um, your own personal family's connection to some of the wood and the timber that was brought mm -hmm. from your town. And because um, 
here in this institution, we study material culture. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, on what you know about um, some of the objects and the material culture from the Philippines that were exhibited in the Philippine village or that were created by people um, while they were there, if, if, um, if that happened. Yeah, um, so my family or just in, in general? Whatever you, okay. whatever you know, whatever okay. you prefer. I'll start with, uh, I guess, my family's contributions because um, I know one of the um, one of the things that they I don't know if they took or they received permission to bring trees from my town or lumber, um, and those were listed in the the catalog that I had as a as a slide. Um, those were displayed in a in the forestry building, and there were just all these like slices of lumber side by side, um, different types of woods that. Um, American investors could now exploit, basically. Um, I know that there were a lot of medicinal plants which are now in Missouri Botanical Garden archives as uh, dried plants, um, preserved plants. Um, there are also some living trees at the Missouri Botanical Garden um, that are over 150 years old that were shown at the 1904 World's Fair. Um, so that's actually really comforting to me because it's the one thing that I guess kind of lives on, um, and I forgot to mention that that I do go to the the Climatron at the Botanical Garden a lot and visit the trees. Um, but as far as the other exhibits, um, yeah, I think that's something that doesn't get talked about talked about a lot um, because the majority of the buildings were housing these exhibits of different fabrics, piña, abaca, um, you know, different embroideries, different textiles um, from different cultures in the Philippines, and there were baskets, there were, um, there were weapons, spears, swords, um, agricultural products, seeds, um, just so much, so much stuff. It's like they took the entire contents of the Philippines and just brought them to St. Louis, and now they're dispersed in all these museums all over the country. Um, does that start to answer your question? Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, well, I hope you'll all thank me again. Join me again in thanking. Not thank, don't thank me. Please join me in thanking Jana again. <laughs>